Well, this morning is Father's Day, and we're taking a break from our normal journey through the Gospel of John. And we hopped over to the Gospel of Luke this morning. And um, oftentimes, Father's Day is a, a good time to uh, look at uh, some of what the Bible has to say about fatherhood. And about uh, not just fathers in general, or even men in general, but really, as the Word of God often is, it's applicable to all of us in some way. And so, uh, so I want us to talk this morning about a message that I've titled, The Righteous Father. Now, most of us know this parable of the, um, of the prodigal son, as we call it, and that we've just read. And, um, and in it, we often focus on... Uh, on usually the prodigal son, right? He is the main point, the main person in the story. And of course, he certainly deserves the attention uh, in terms of what the teaching is about. But of course, we know that this story is more than just a, a, um, an illusion that Jesus paints there for us, but rather it's a representation. It's a representation of God the Father and how he deals with those who are lost and how much he rejoices as to those that turn back to him. And so this morning, I want us to look at the question of the prodigal son and the whole story here from the perspective of what can we learn from the father in the story, the righteous father. You know, our society today has a lot of um, misconceptions about what it is to be a good father. Um, I was... As you scroll on Facebook or you go on social media, there are these things as, as uh, you tend to, they have these little things to, um, I don't even know what they're for. I guess they're like for like greeting, animated greeting cards or something. And uh, they have like, you can put your dad's face in like this video, you know, and then there's some guy in there saying happy Father's Day or doing what dads do or whatever they do. And uh, it's just supposed to be fun and crazy and whatever. But you realize that the things that they put out in the video, the, the things that are talked about in the card are things like they have them in, in grilling the hamburgers, right? That's what makes a good dad. A dad that can put on the bib and the, the hat and, and grill the hamburgers on Father's Day. Or the, the dad that has the, he has his, the one that has a stack of money and he's like handing it out to all of his kids, right? And he's like, this makes the good dad. He's got the money. He's taking care of whatever the kids want. Uh, and, you know, there's all these misconceptions. You know, um, I guess maybe there's so many poor examples of what fatherhood in our society that maybe this is the best we can come up with. Uh, and, of course, you can't be a dad in today's day and age without being... Um, I don't think this was a thing when I was a kid, but today, you know what they have? They have the whole group of sayings and jokes that are called dad jokes. You know what dad jokes I don't, I don't remember them being called that years ago, but they have, they call them dad jokes. They used just, just call them like puns. It's like things like this. When is a car not a car? When it turns into a driveway. Sometimes it takes you a minute, right? Why are pediatricians always so angry? Because they have little patience. Did you know the first French fries weren't really cooked in France? No, they were cooked in Greece. I know, a lot of them make you groan, don't they? What's the leading cause of dry skin? Towels. <laughs> and my, fa my favorite one, how many apples grow on a tree? All of them, yeah. Some of you guys know the dad jokes, that's good. Well, this is, a <laughs> you can use them at no charge. There's no commission on those today. You can freely use them as you, as you feel, feel, uh, feel inclined. But, uh, but none of these things, even if your whole pocket's full of these dad jokes, and even if you can grill a mean hamburger, those things are not what should define us as being good dads or being righteous fathers or being what really what God wants us to be. And what I want us to do this morning is look at really this picture of God the Father. And of course, if we are to grow close to Him, as we just Heard into him, being nearer to God, our whole point is to be more like him. 
Right. So this is a story, not just an abstract of, well, God, the father's this way and this is a model we can never live up to. No, this is always meant to be a teaching story of something that these are values. These are principles. These are ideas that we are to try to absorb and and resemble in our own lives. And so the first thing that uh, we want us to just work through this story. And I just want to make a few comments as we go regarding what the righteous father looks like in the parable of the prodigal son. Of course, we, we know the story well. A certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. You know, the first thing maybe is a tough one for us to, to hear or, 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 or always feel because we, we tend to have this mindset that if you're a righteous father, that all of your kids are going to be righteous as well. And the sad fact is, God made each of us with free will. Now, we are supposed to you know, manage our households and we, we can't just you know, throw our hands up and say, well, they're going to be what they're going to be. No, we are to teach. We are to train. We are to put boundaries up. We are to do all we can to train and guide our children the way we are. And, you know, if this is a picture of God, the father, you can't tell me this father in the story doesn't resemble someone who was doing all he could, all he could to train his sons properly. And yet he gets this request. From the younger son. son. Dad, I want my inheritance now. <laughs> I want what's coming to me. Uh, and he doesn't tell him, uh, uh, you know, obliquely in the story. But it's not, not too hard to figure out what he's about to go do. Because uh, it says there in verse 13, not many days after, the younger son gathered it all together. Uh, the, the, the father knew enough about his son to understand what it is his son was, was planning uh, to do with all of this, uh, this inheritance that he was going to gain. Um, I guess there's some things about this, too. That these are just corollaries that you think about. You know, sometimes God gives us things because we ask for them. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but, you know, God gives us obviously good things, right? But sometimes God gives us good things even if he knows we won't use them for good, good purposes, and that's the case here. The, the, the son had no right to ask for this, right? The son had, had no, uh, no, no standing to be able to come and say, I, I deserve this or I demand this. No, it, it was, he was completely out of place. He was completely out of order to even approach his father with this type of request. But even though that was the case, the father says, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you something you don't deserve. And I'm going to give you something that is that is good. And that the son, even though the father would know what the son was about to do with it. Now, I don't under, always understand how that works, but I do know that sometimes God gives us things in our life, even good things that we completely misuse and abuse and waste. <laughs> and he does it for the same purpose that this man gave his younger son the inheritance so that ultimately, because we know the end of the story, so that ultimately we can come to the end of ourselves and turn back to him. That's what really the father wanted to have happen with his younger son. What did really from the beginning of the story, what does this father want from his younger son? He wants his younger son's heart. He wants his younger son to be united with him, to be drawn close to him, to be to be completely um, bonded with the father. And that obviously hadn't happened. It had been something that, you know, had the, the son was just waiting for his last chance to pocket some money and, and beat it. <laughs> and that's exactly the story that we see. The father knew these things about his son. But yet, he did give the good thing. And even though, um, even though we think of the prodigal son as the the bad son. You know, we tend to think of these as we have the bad son who went out and did all the bad things. And then we have the good son who went and stayed and worked and helped and did all these things. Do you realize even in the end, the, the good son wasn't even so good? Right? We, we tend to give him the pass 
He was like, well, sure, he's justified in feeling the way he did. Look how he got mistreated. <laughs> you know, but the fact is, neither of the sons were good. So here we have the righteous father, and we have one that's doing the right thing and one son that's not. But in the end, neither of their hearts were right. <laughs> Neither of their hearts were good. Even the young son was begrudged his brother. He, 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 he was angry. He was all these things at the end. We see it, he wouldn't even go in. He had, his father had to come out and entreat him to come back in. And his, he, he's self-righteous too, this, this other son. Did you notice that? Verses 28 and 29. What did he say to his father? He says, Lo, these many years do I serve thee. Neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. Do you think that's true? <laughs> not once did I ever talk back to you, Dad. <laughs> not once did I ever not go and obey you completely and wholly, just when you said, just how you said, just because you said. <laughs> oh, no. All these years I've done the right thing. I've always done 100% what you've told me to do. Now, does that sound like someone that Jesus may have talked to? <laughs> Recently, in the stories, like the rich young ruler, <laughs> he comes to Jesus and he says, Oh, Jesus, he says, what can I do to be saved? Because I've done everything. <laughs> I, I've got my whole life right. <laughs> and what does Jesus say? Go and sell all that you have <laughs> and then come and take up your cross and follow me. You need to learn some humility. <laughs> you need to learn that you need my grace. You need to learn that you need my mercy, that you can't do it on your own. And if you are so self-righteous that you believe that you've kept it all, then you're self-deceived. <laughs> you're not just self-righteous. And that was the case for the older son as well. So the righteous father didn't actually have any righteous children. He had one self-righteous child, <laughs> and he had one that just wanted to go live for the world. I don't know about you, but I got to think that that father's heart must have been breaking. You know, we all know families. Maybe we're part of families. Maybe we have children or grandchildren. We have those in our family units <laughs> that have broken our hearts at times. And you know, I think the point from the story here is this. The righteous father might not always have righteous children. But that doesn't mean he never stops loving them. He never stops caring for them. And he's always positive and hopeful that they're going to turn back to him. And isn't that not just true in our own families? Isn't it true of our God, who is our Father as well? <laughs> Even those of us who maybe have accepted Christ as our Savior, how many times do we turn from the Lord in our walk with him? How many times do we let him down as our righteous Father? You know what? He's still up there praying for us, caring for us, providing for us, giving us the mercy day by day, giving us the grace, and knowing that there's a day when we will come to the end of ourselves and turn back to him as well. That's what God wants. He wants that relationship not to be severed, not just because we can't be righteous, but, we, but because we don't want to be righteous. <laughs> That's the problem with us. The righteous father doesn't always do that. And you know, the fact is, we are responsible as parents, as fathers, as grandparents, as even older folks here in the church that train and are role models to our younger people. We are to be those examples and guides for our children. And we need to continue to do our best and recognize their heart is in God's hands. God's got to do his work in them. And that doesn't excuse our work that we need to do for them. And we will be held responsible for how we conduct ourselves in this area. But we are not accountable for how, how our children choose to respond. We are accountable for how we've trained them, for how we've guided them, for how we've done our best to meet their needs, to be righteous before them. But how they choose to respond is not something we are held accountable for. Well, let's keep moving, because obviously there's a lot more to the story. So the righteous father may not always have righteous children. 
And the second point here is, comes out of verse 17. We see the story evolve. And, uh, of course, the, the younger son went and wasted his money and ended up in starvation mode. And uh, it says in verse 16, He would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. By the way, this is just a side note as well. Do you notice here is a Jewish son feeding pigs? There's something a little ironic about that. <laughs> The Jews didn't eat pigs. <laughs> Here he was, tending to the pigs. And uh, verse 17, it says, And when he came to himself, it was like finally he woke up one day. And he says to himself, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? You know, the second thing that we see about this righteous father is that even though he wasn't present with his child, his reputation continued. You see, here was, the, here was the son in the worst of worst conditions. He was worried about starving himself to death. He didn't know where his next meal was going to come from. He was out of money. He was out of hope. And do you realize what picture came to his mind at that worst point in his life? His father's reputation. His father's goodness. His father's willingness to provide abundantly and to treat people fairly. He began to think of his hired servants that he would have grown up with and he would have known. He thought, you know what? My dad always treated his employees right. My dad made sure that his employees never went hungry. My dad was a fair man. My dad was someone who would do the right thing to make sure that people had their needs provided for. And this reputation is what comes back to this young man at the depth of his despair. And isn't that true that reputations tend to linger in our minds? You get into a certain situation, you get into a, have a certain need with a certain problem, and you know what first tends to pop into your mind when you exhausted your own options that you've tried on your own? As you begin to recognize or realize or think about those people that can help you. <laughs> and how do you know who it is that could most be able to help you? You think about the experience you've had with them. You think about the reputation that they've had not only in your own life, but in the lives of others around. And this is where the young man got brought back to because this father had a reputation for treating people, even his own hired hands, with respect and kindness and fairness. He was not stingy. He was not always trying to cut corners. He wasn't that father who was always, you know, well, I'm going to hold back this because I don't think you did good enough work for me today. You know, it was, it was, he was always making sure people were treated right. And beyond treating his own family right, he was known for treating strangers right as well. That's what the righteous father's reputation was all about. And it was that reputation that ultimately penetrated this young man's life. Do you see again why it's so important that as parents we are to be role models? The importance of living out our faith day in and day out so that we create a reputation or a heritage that even if the words don't get through now... <laughs> Some point down the road, some point in the future, that young person grows up, they get to the end of themselves, and they say, you know, my dad would have done it this way. <laughs> or my mom would have said this. Or here's the role model I had from that person, my Sunday school teacher in church, or some of those folks in church that really cared for me, that really loved me. What kind of person were they? Do you realize when people get to the end of themselves and they're out of options, it is these people, these memories of people that will ultimately come back to them and inform how they should live as well. And this is what the young man decided. He decided, I'm coming back because I know my dad has a reputation. Even if I've deserved nothing, he's a fair man and he'll treat me with respect and he'll treat me like his hired hands. Maybe I can even just get a job. He'll, he'll be fair enough with me. He won't hold this against me. He may even just hire me back as one of his hired hands. That's, that's where the young man was. 
And so then we continue with the story in verse 20. And so it says, uh, he says in verse 20, he arose, he came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. You know, I love the story of the prodigal son for this reason, because it paints the picture of what a genuine, righteous father is that's different than the picture of our society today. You know, we paint men to, today as you got to be macho. I'm not sure if that's a current term or not, but that probably dates me. <laughs> you got to be with it, you know. Um, you grow up and you had this picture. It's VBS week. We won't be putting these advertisements up, but you may remember the Marlboro Man, right? The cat. I'm not. I'm not using this for advertising. Don't worry. But <laughs> you know, it was the rugged, outdoorsy, hat horse out for the out for the kill. He could do anything. No, no fear of anything. This is the picture of what manhood is. Do you realize this man's also hard? That picture, that, pi that picture of that man is, is hard and often unloving and often uncaring and often insensitive. And do you realize those are not the qualities that God would have for us? Instead, he gives us this model. The father sees the son far off. And he says, when he was yet a great way off, what did his father do? He got the list out of things he was going to tell his son. Here's the things that I'm going to lecture you on when you get back, buddy. <laughs> it's about time you get back so that I can you know, give you what for. <laughs> well, that's our mindset, isn't it? <laughs> that's how we think. And that's hard for us because do our kids maybe need that lecture? Yeah, they probably do. <laughs> but do you realize what he showed his son? From when he was a great way off, he showed compassion. It says he had compassion and he ran. He ran towards his son and he fell on his neck and he kissed him. His greatest desire was not just to teach the boy a lesson and tell him, I told you so. Or to wallow in the way his son probably had wrecked a family name. No, his greatest desire was that his son was returning to him. Maybe he saw a boy who had learned some of the hardest lessons you can learn in life through the school of hard knocks. And maybe he saw that the boy now wore the scars of the world in his own life. Maybe he recognized that a boy had to grow up in maybe some of the worst of conditions and the worst of ways. And maybe he recognized, really, the answer is that he's coming back to me. <laughs> that he's returning home. You see, in this way, the father cared more about the son than he cared about himself. Than he cared even about his own family name. That he cared even on about being right. That he cared even more about, you know, um, getting that last I told you so in. And instead of allowing those things to well up inside of him and control his temper and to create this anger and to create this backlash and to ultimately produce more division, what did the father choose to do? Show love. He showed compassion. Even before he heard a word that that boy had to say. This was the picture of the righteous father. Then let's see what happens in verse 21 to 22. The son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe. And put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Do you know what happened between tw verses 21 and 22 there? The father forgave the son. Somewhere between verse 21 and 22, the father said, son, I forgive you. And his forgiveness was whole and his forgiveness was complete. He wasn't holding a thing against that son. He was forgiven. And you know, this is uh, another picture of what a righteous father is. A father that offers 
forgiveness. And I sure am glad that we can read a parable like this and learn something about God the Father in it and learn something about His forgiveness towards us in the same fashion. <laughs> because He certainly has plenty of things to hold over my head. <laughs> he has certainly has things in each one of our lives that He could say, you know, I forgive you, but... <laughs> I forgive you, I, but, you know, this problem is just too much. <laughs> You're going to have to pay for your own sin there. <laughs> No, forgiveness is whole. It's complete. It's unreserved. He says, if I'm saying it's forgive, what does God say about our sins? He says, he puts our sins as far as the east is from the west. When he, we ask for forgiveness, when we allow the blood of Jesus Christ to wash us of sin, the Bible says we become white as snow. And that's the new fallen type of snow. Not the kind that's been sitting around for weeks. This is, this is white. This is purity. This is cleansed. We are forgiven. When God says we're forgiven, we're forgiven. The son simply had to come and acknowledge his sin, repent of his sin, and ask for that forgiveness. That's why we repeat it so often, which is 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The Bible op offers that not just for those that need to know Him for the first time, but for those that need to re-know Him <laughs> again. Those that need to come back to Him. For many of us in our lives, it's sin that keeps us from being in that close relationship with the Lord. It's our sin that we want to hold on to. It's the sin that we still think is going to make us happy. It's the sin that we continue to feel like is somehow going to provide some level of fulfillment for me. But you know what? He wants us to get rid of that sin. He wants us to confess it. And the Bible says He'll forgive us. <laughs> He'll wash us pure. He'll offer it to us just like this son did. And it will... It will bring us into a closer relationship with him. In verse 22, that's why it says, The father says to his servants, Bring forth the best robe. Put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. We need to treat this man again like he's one of my sons. Because he's back home again. Well, the last thought I have about the righteous father is not with the younger son. It's actually with the older one. And we see this, uh, this aftermath of the father's acceptance of the, of the younger son. We've already talked about it a bit. It says in verse 25, his elder son was in the field when all this was going on. And it says, as he came and he drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he thought, it's not my birthday today. <laughs> That's not in there. <laughs> But that's what he was thinking. And so in verse 26, he says, He called one, one of his servants and he asked, What do these things mean? And he said unto them, verse 27, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And in verse 28 it says, He was angry. It didn't take him long to put two and two together. Realize that the younger son who was a deadbeat, who had done the wrong thing from the beginning, who had gone and wasted things, who had, who had ruined the family's name, who had taken and dragged this, this whole thing through the mud and had been gone for all this time, while he had been working and laboring and doing his best and living at home, he, it was clear that this wasn't what he thought should happen. <laughs> In fact, not just a little bit, a lot. It says he was angry, and so, so he was so angry, he would not go in. He wouldn't even go inside the house. He says, I'm not even putting my foot in there, because I don't want one part of celebrating his return. There was obviously a rift that had opened up at this point. <laughs> right? Probably things had been going along fine. He and his dad had been working the fields, and, 
and, and building the business or whatever it is that they were doing. And he had, he had all this time that the younger son was away. He felt like he had everything figured out and this relationship was good. And the next thing you know, boom. Back comes the younger son, and this rift opens wide up. He won't even set foot in the house now. He certainly doesn't want to talk to his younger brother. <laughs> certainly doesn't want to hear or see from him anymore. I'm never going to talk to him again. I wrote him off years ago. <laughs> he went his own way and did his own thing, and he turned his back on our family. Well, I'm turning my back on him. This is what the older brother was saying. He was angry. He felt used. He felt taken advantage of. And he felt like he was justified in feeling all of those things. And you know, us sitting all, all these years later, we can sit and we can nod our heads and say, yes, you're right, I can see how he would feel that way. <laughs> but the fact is, he was still wrong. <laughs> he was wrong to feel that way. And the father knew that this older son was wrong in his attitude. And yet, even though this was true, what do we see the, young, the father do to this older son? He comes out. It says in, um, um, it says in verse 28, it says, He was angry, he would not go in, and therefore his father came out. And entreated him. That means he, he begged him. He asked him, come on, come on, son. Let's, let's go in. Let's put bygones be bygones. Let's, let's bury the hatchet. Let's just come on in and make our family uh, unified again. We're, we're, we just need to come in and celebrate. He's, he's back home again. You, you can hear this entreaty that this father must have made to the son. And he entreated him to come in in verse 29. And it says, he answering said to his father, Oh, I've done all these things. I've not transgressed at any time. And he says, You never even gave me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. He says, I'm not only just angry with him, Dad. I'm angry with you. <laughs> you see, he had isolated himself from everyone. He had decided he's picking a fight with not just the brother, but with the father as well. And do you realize what the father's response here is? In the same way that he went and ran towards the younger son who was returning to him, he was now running to the son who wasn't returning to him. <laughs> he came out of the house. He left the party. He went to try to share and convince and argue the point that he was in the wrong. He tried to show this older son that you shouldn't be upset. <laughs> You're in the wrong here, son. I'm here to, to help you. I'm here to show you. You need to show some love. He, he wanted to use this as a teaching moment. He wanted to bring reconciliation back to the house again. He had reconciled with his younger son at the expense of creating a rift with his older son. <laughs> Sometimes family politics are difficult, aren't they? <laughs> this is exactly what happened. <laughs> And so he goes out and he tries to entreat. He's seeking peace. He seeks reconciliation between the sons and between him. And do you realize if the father had not done this, that older son might have held that grudge the rest of his life. <laughs> you all know some folks who have held some grudges <laughs> for a long time. Some who said, I am not going to speak, I'm not going to talk, I'm, you know, I'm done, I've written them off, whatever it is. And you realize that's not what we're called to be as Christians. We're supposed to show love. We're supposed to seek peace. We're supposed to seek reconciliation. And you know, what does he say in verse 30 and uh, verse 31? He says, said unto him, son... Thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. Now one of the things that we don't know about this parable, Jesus doesn't give it to us, is whatever happened to that older son. We know that the younger son was welcomed back. He was forgiven. He was brought back into a relationship again with the father. And we don't ever hear, kind of like at the end of the book of Jonah, we don't ever hear exactly what his response was. <laughs> All we hear is, you know, 
maybe there's more of us that's more like the older son than the younger. And maybe in terms of when we see the model of the righteous father, maybe there are some things in this attitude, in his approach, in his dealing with his sons that we haven't done so well as role models in our young people's lives. Whether you're a father or a mother or a teacher or just an elder here who works in the life of young people, we need to recognize these same principles as we become role models for them. Recognize that the righteous father may not always have righteous children. The righteous father has a reputation, a reputation of fairness and kindness and respect. The righteous father is full of compassion, even when he doesn't feel like it. The righteous father offers forgiveness, and that forgiveness is complete and whole. And even for those that aren't turning to the Lord, the righteous father actively goes out and seeks the peace and reconciliation that these folks need to have in their life. And I think if we begin to put these models in place, we need to throw the worlds out. <laughs> Grilling hamburgers and telling dad jokes aren't going to mean so much. <laughs> because we're going to have made an impact that's going to last for generations to come.